James uh, tonight. And I want us to look in James 1 and verse 1. We're going to, we're going to read four verses. That's what I want to deal with. It says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad. Greet my brethren. Count it all joy when ye fall into divers temptations. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Now, James is addressing, as you can see, he, he, he addresses it to the twelve tribes who are scattered abroad. Now, the, what that means is that the twelve tribes are all the Jews. Every All Jews came from one of the twelve sons of Israel. And so they're, they're, they're scattered abroad. They're all over the, the known Roman Empire. That's who he's addressing. All of you Jews that are out there in the Roman Empire. And he, remember, he's, he's trying to, to, to reach all of these churches that are scattered all over the Roman Empire. And that's who he's writing to. And, and they wrote, back then, they, they didn't have sheets of paper like you and I do. They wrote on scrolls. And so, this was a long letter, which would have made it a very long scroll. That's why you see these writers start off with their name. I, Paul, a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. Or James, a servant of God. That's, they put it at the top of the scroll. We're, we're used to, when we receive a letter, back in the letter days, we were used to being able to get a letter, and, and people usually sign it at the bottom of the letter, sincerely, or love, or whatever it might be, and then sign your name. But back then, if you got a scroll, you would have to unroll the whole thing to be able to see who sent it. Maybe this is something we want to read. Maybe this is something we don't want to you'd have to unroll the whole thing to try to figure out who's writing this. So that's the reason why they put their name at the very beginning. James, that way when you open the scroll, you know immediately it's from James. James writes here, and he puts his name at the very top, and he tells us he's a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, and he tells us who it's address, just like when you would write a letter to uh, to me, you might say, Dear Larry, or Dear Pastor, or Dear Brother. Well, James is addressing, after he identifies himself, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, and then he, he addresses it, Dear Twelve Tribes of Israel. Listen to me, Dear Brethren of the Jewish faith. Sending this out to these people. He wants them to understand something. The subject is found in verse 3. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. That's the whole gist of the letter. And that is that, that these people, these Jews, were struggling. These Jews were going through some hard times. These, these, these are Jews. That, uh, that, that he is writing to, and as you can imagine, these are the 12 tribes of Israel, but he, these Jews are now Christians. They've, they've been saved. That's who he's writing to. He's writing to Jewish Christians. Now, add this. We're gonna, here's the trifecta. The three things that really make this this subject very different. He's addressing Jews who are now Christians who live in the Roman Empire. If you want, if you want to try to find trouble in your life, be a Jew that
that has been converted to Christianity that is living in the living in the Roman Empire. You won't find any help anywhere. You are an outcast. Being a Jew in the Roman Empire is one problem. You you were probably a slave or had been a slave and have now been set free. But, but now you've been converted to Christianity. But there's one thing the, the Romans don't want. They don't want Jews hanging around that, that they don't that it, they don't need. And they don't want Jews, especially, who have been converted to Christianity. They don't want Christians. They don't want Jews. But you're both, and you're living in the Roman Empire. That's what the whole letter is about to these people. It's a letter to the churches they belong to. And he and and James knows that these people are going through trouble. You would go, you would be going through trouble also. If you were a Jew that's a Christian that was living in the Roman Empire, you would be going through some tough times also. <laughs> James is writing to these people, and he's trying to get them to understand. They've got to learn to live by faith. Because their troubles are not going away. They're living in a Roman Empire that's not going away. And they're, they're, if they stay there, which... Most likely they have to. They've been there forever. Some of them have been. Some of them have been over in that Roman Empire area uh, since uh, their families were taken away by uh, uh, by by the early by the early uh, 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 armies that invaded uh, Israel way back in 500 BC. They were carried away. But Nebuchadnezzar. And all of his armies, and 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 all of these other groups, and and ever over and over and over, all of these people have have uh, somehow had something to do with with getting these people uh, uh, carried away as slaves. And they have lived, they have lived there for uh, for hundreds of years. So this is their home, the Roman Empire, wherever it might be, over in Greece, over up in the Turkish area, all the way over to where Italy is, and, and all about that whole area is all the Roman Empire. And then up into Persia and, and, and north of Israel and all through all of those countries up there. Those were people that have carried these Israelites away. Now these Israelites, it's generation after generation, have grown up there. That's their home. And yet, yet they they're never welcome. They're, they're always a Jew. They're always a Christian. And so they always have problems. They want to go out and get a job, do something. People always are push them away because they're Jewish, they're Christian, and, and they, they're not welcome there. So they always struggle with problems. James is writing to them, and he's trying to tell them that they need to face these problems. They need to face these problems and have faith that God is going to get them through. You know, when we talk about faith, if I could, if I could just talk a minute about faith, because that's what the title of my message is, and that's finding happiness through your trials. Finding happiness through your trials. What we're going to find out is what God tells us here about finding happiness through all the trials that we go through. He's going to tell us that it's going to take faith. It's going to take faith in God to get you through the trial after trial. A trial is a is a problem. It's a it's a storm. It's something that you go through. He he uses the word he uses the word temptation, but it's it's not a temptation as to be tempted to sin. It's a temptation as if you've got to face a trial in your life. That's what it's all about. James is writing to them about faith, and he's saying you've got to have faith. You know, when we talk about faith, every one of you came in here tonight, and, and you sat down in a chair, and none of you, none of you leaned over and pushed down on it None of you tried to shake it. None of you tried to see 
how much weight it would hold. You just came in and sat down because you had faith. You had faith in that chair, that that chair was going to hold you. It's got a metal base. It's got metal legs. It's got a comfortable seat in the back. And when you walked in, you just had faith. This thing's going to hold me, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to take care of me. I'm going to sit down without any problem. That's what faith is. That's what faith is. It was, it's something that's not seen. Remember the definition of faith in, in, in the, the book of Hebrew, the Hebrew uh, uh, chapter about faith? It, it says it's something that, that, uh, that, that's not seen. It's something that, that, that we just trust, that we know. And so when you came in by faith, you just sat down in a chair. And you knew that it was going to hold you. You'll go out there and you'll get in an automobile in a little while. You'll crank it up. And by faith, you'll just drive off because you believe that thing's going to get you home. If you didn't, you'd walk. Or you'd call somebody else and say, you know what, I'm, I'm driving uh, whatever and I don't think it's going to get me home. Uh, but you know what, you, you just by faith, you're believing that that car is going to get there. You know, when I was growing up, by faith, I trusted what my mom and dad told me. I believed. You know, if my dad told me it was going to rain, I just, okay, it, it's going to rain. Why? Because dad told me that. You know, it's, it's just I had faith in what they said, what they did, who they were. I had faith in, in, in the doctor. I went, you know, I go to a doctor. You go to a doctor. You, you have faith in what that doctor said. The doctor will tell you, well, you need to be careful about this. You need to watch your diet about this. You've got, you've got this thing or that thing. Or we, we need to run some blood tests on you or whatever. And by faith, you're trusting in that doctor. That's what faith is. Faith is just trusting and knowing. Every one of you believed in the Lord Jesus Christ at some point in time in your life. You, you believe by faith. You've never met him. You've never talked to him. You've never stood face to face uh, to that man that walked upon this earth, the Son of God. None of us have. But I believe totally by faith on everything they tell me in this book about that man. I trust by faith with all of my heart that what he said and what he did, that's going to get me to heaven. My faith is in him. That's what faith is. And that's what James is talking about here. That these people were going to have to have that kind of faith to get them through the trials that they were going through. Because nobody wanted them, nobody liked them, and nobody wanted to deal with them in any way. They wanted to enslave them, they wanted to do whatever it took. And, and James is saying, you know what, you've got to have faith. You've just got to have faith that God's going to get you through this thing. And that's what that's what this this thing, this book right here of James is all about. It's about it's about having faith. But now James adds something to faith. Now, remember, Paul talks about faith, and Paul said that uh, that faith and without works, he said faith and faith alone. You've got to believe Jesus by faith. You've got to trust by faith, not by works. Remember, that's what he said. He said, not by works, uh, uh, but he said, by faith, you've got to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. But notice what James said in chapter 2, uh, uh, verse, look over in, in chapter 2, verse 17 and 18. In what James says in chapter 2, verse 17 and 18, he says, even so, faith, if it hath not worked, is dead being alone. He said, Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Uh, show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. He said, He said in verse 17, Faith, if it hath not works, is dead. And so James adds works. Paul said, not by works. No, not by works, lest any man should boast. So he says, if you, if you start putting works to your faith, 
and you're going to boast about what you're doing. And James is saying, I'll show you my faith by my works. Now, they're not contradicting one another. And that's the thing you have to remember. Paul is saying, you get saved by faith, you can't work your way to heaven. James is saying, you get saved by faith, and you can't work your way to heaven. But after you get saved, after you get saved, you're going to want to work. You're going to want to do something. You're going to want to get out there and let people know that you've been born again. There's something that you have been called to do. You know, in our Bible college on Sunday night, what we talk about this past Sunday night, we talked about what God wants you to do after you got saved. Only a saved person gets a spiritual gift. Only a saved person, uh, after, after they get the Holy Spirit in their heart, the Holy Spirit begins to call you to do some kind of work for the Lord. And that's what we did Sunday night. We talked about spiritual gifts. I handed you that questionnaire, 130 questions. And in that questionnaire, as you fill it out, and you answer that questionnaire, you will find out, you will find out what your calling is and what God has called you to do, uh, to, to, to work for him. That's God's calling. So that's what I did. That's what I gave you was that questionnaire. You're doing what James said do, and that is you're going to show the world through your works that you are saved. And you don't work to go to heaven. You work because you are going to heaven. And that's something you have to remember. And so James is talking about talking about works, that we need to do something for him. And that's we, we do that through faith. We do that through faith. So he's, he's trying to get us to understand that. First of all, let me just explain to you who this James is, okay? Who is this James that's writing this book? Well, there's a lot of Jameses in the Bible. Now, there was James, the son of, uh, the brother of John. You remember, Zebedee, the, the, the man of thunder, had two sons, John, the apostle, John, and James, John and James. That James, if you remember, that James was killed by Herod when he was in prison. He was the first apostle that was martyred, James, the brother of John. We don't think that's this James that's writing this book. Then there's, then there's James, the son of Alphaeus. Great, great man, and a lot, you know, it, we know a few things about him, but he's kind of he's kind of just off to the outside there. We we the Lord doesn't talk about him much, although what he says about him are great things, but he's just not present all the time. And then there's James, the father of Judas. Now, not, not Judas Iscariot, but the father of Judas, uh, one, of the, uh, uh, one of the great leaders in, in the church. James is his father. But still, we don't think that's the James that wrote this book. But there is a James, there is a James that is the half-brother of the Lord Jesus. He is the son of Mary and Joseph. Now, he was an unbeliever of the Lord Jesus Christ for, for a lot of his life. But he got saved, and in fact, he's mentioned by the Lord. When the Lord came back and appeared to many people, one of the people that is mentioned in the Bible that the Lord appears to is James, his half-brother. And that's the James we think. Pretty sure uh, there's a lot of lot of lot of positive thoughts about that. They think this is the James that writes this letter to the Jews that were scattered abroad. And so here we have this James. The, he he became the pillar of the church in Jerusalem, a great man of God, the half brother of the Lord Jesus Christ, the son of Mary and Joseph, and and we think this is. Pretty sure that it is. But here he is writing to us. And he's telling us. Notice in verse 2, 
he, he starts out by saying, my brethren. So we know that he's talking to Christians. Okay, We know he's talking to Jewish Christians. And then he says this. Count it all joy when you fall into divers' temptation. Now, how many of us could do that? <laughs> that we could just count it all joy when we just fall into all kinds of problems. We fall directly into the pit full of full of uh, 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 molten lava and, and, and tar and all the problems of the world. We just fall right into it. And, and, and he says, count it all joy. Well, we have to really have to look at this and analyze what he's saying here because the fact is nobody, nobody can find joy that can fall into divers' temptation. But we have to ask the Lord, Lord, is that what you're saying? Am I, am I missing something here? But you get my point of verse, verse 16. That is that James teaches us about our attitude toward Christ. That's the point. That James is teaching us uh, uh, about our attitude toward Christ. He, he starts out by saying, my brethren. So we know that he's talking to believers. And then he says this he says, count it all joy. Now, what is, he, what is he saying there? Count it all joy. What he's trying to get us to, to see here is that we should look at the troubles in our life and then look for the opportunity. This is the, the point that he's trying to get across. We should look for the opportunity in that trouble Look for the opportunity to lift up God. That's what he wants us to do. In this trouble that we're going through, this diverse temptation, divers means many different kinds of temptation. Temptations can mean two things. It can mean, it can mean a, a sin, that's a temptation, or it can mean problems in our life, going through problems. All right, he's not talking about sin. Not talking about that we look at sin and count it all joy. No, he's talking about looking at the problem that you're going through, facing the problem that you're going through. And he said, count it all joy. That is, we should we should look at it and say, you know what, I've got an opportunity here. I've got an opportunity to share the Lord Jesus Christ in the midst of all of my troubles, in the midst of my problems here. I need to look and see, how can I share Jesus Christ when I'm in this trouble? How can I take this trouble and, and show that, that I've got an opportunity to, to lift God up in all of this? Nobody's going to enjoy that. That's not what he's saying. Count it all joy that you're going through this thing. Nobody's going to count it all joy. We count it. We count it joy for the opportunity that I can somehow lift up God in all of this. That I can go through this thing and, and face it and try to show people that, that God is going to get me through this thing. I'm not. I'm, I'm not going to enjoy one bit about <laughs> facing the trial. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at it and say, you know what, in, in this terrible thing that I've got to face, that I've got to go through. I want to look at some beam of light in this thing in which I can share Jesus Christ. E even if I am on my knees, I'm, I'm crying out, I'm hurting, I'm going through this thing, What I, I'm asking God, God, how can I use this terrible thing that I'm going through to be able to share? Where is the point? How can I get Jesus wedged into this thing? And he says, so he says, he says, count it all joy. Did you notice the word when right there? My brother, and count it all joy when? Not if. It's when. Well, every one of us know that we're going to go through trial. We're going to go through. It's when we go through it. He says, now, we're going to go through it. 
We don't know when, but we are going to go through it. And then he uses the word fall. Fall. That, that Greek word is parapipto. And, and what it means is that you that's when you find yourself in a bad situation. It's not a physical fall. You didn't, you didn't quit on God. You didn't go out and sin and, and just absolutely just fall off the cliff uh, uh, cursing everybody. And that's not the fall that he's talking about. The fall, parapipto, that Greek word, simply means I mean, you just you walk into it. You just walk into a bad situation. You, you didn't ask for it. You didn't do anything to deserve it. You just wound that you found yourself in a in a bad situation. And, and all of us have. Every one of us at some point in time have walked into a situation that we didn't know, that we, it wasn't anything that we could do. You know what? Bad situations come from us by the devil. The devil just finds a time that he can just hit us with, with both barrels. He, can, he just hits us and drops us to our knees with the hope that he's going he's gonna to destroy us and keep us from serving God. That's his, that's his goal. He's going to hit us with, with uh, as much as he can. But also, do you know what? That other people, people can, can cause you to, to find yourself in bad situations. And then also, you, you can do it yourself. Every one of us can get ourselves in a mess. And we don't need God. We don't need the devil. We don't need other people. It's just something that we do. We make the decision, and we find ourselves in a bad situation. And, and, and what James is saying is that when you find yourself, when you fall into divers temptation, that word temptation just simply means that you have gotten yourself into a mess, you, you got into a bad situation, and you just walked into it. What that word fall meant that you didn't do something to deserve it. You just walked, you just walked right into it. And there it was. And it was handed to you on a platter. Here struggle. And they just and there you go. And what he's saying is that we should look at that. Look at that situation and say, how can I glorify God in all of this. How can I somehow get Jesus wedged into this? How can I show other people, you know what, yes, I'm going through a bad time. Yes, I'm going through trouble. Yes, I'm going through a broken heart. Yes, I'm facing uh, lots of difficulties, but somehow I'm going to get Jesus Christ put in the middle of this. I'm going to show people that Jesus Christ is, is with me. He will walk with me through this thing, and he will get me through this thing. That's what James is saying there. He's telling us to count it all joy, simply meaning we're going to go through it, but you just you, you take the situation and try to find out, how can I lift God up in this mess that I'm in? I didn't, I didn't ask for it. I didn't want it, but I'm in it, and I'm not going to run and quit and cry. I'm going to stand here and say, Lord, show me. In verse 3, I want you to see, he says, Knowing this, that the trying of your faith uh, worketh patience. The trying of your faith. James here, uh, the second thing I want you to see is that James teaches us it's not the trial, but the victory over the trial. That's the thing that we should be looking at. The victory over the trial. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. That word trying of your faith worketh patience. That word trying is, the, is a synonym of that word temptation. In other words, they, they mean the same thing. Another word for trying is testing. It's testing that you're going through. It, 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 that, that situation that you're facing, that storm that you're walking through, that hardship, all it is is a test. It's a test that somehow got dumped on you, and instead of letting it beat you down, he says, stand up, face it, and try to figure out, how can I get, how can I get Jesus in the middle of this, in the middle of this storm, so that everybody can see 
that. It wasn't me that got through this thing. It was Jesus. How can I lift God up in all of my trouble? It's an opportunity. That's what James is trying to get us to see. The storm is simply an opportunity to share Jesus Christ. It's an opportunity to share the power of God that will get us through. It's like Moses standing there with, with his back against the Red Sea. And here comes Pharaoh and all of his army. And all of the Israelites by the millions were piled up there. And they were all screaming, oh no, you brought us out here to kill us out here. Pharaoh's going to kill us. And God says, you guys are missing the point. This is an opportunity for me to show how powerful I am. Let Pharaoh come. And then all of a sudden he parts the Red Sea. It was an opportunity for all of them to see the power of God. It was an opportunity for Moses to show the world what God could do. We, we, can't, we can't panic in the, in the face of the storm. We just acknowledge that God is going to get us through this trial. That's what he's trying to say to us. He's trying to teach us that this thing is going to work. Patience. That's what he's saying here. He says it's your faith, the trying of your faith, worketh patience. What does he mean, worketh patience? It means that, it means that, Instead of you running off, instead of you running off, screaming and crying and, 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 and moaning of, of the horrors that, that you're going through, patience is standing in the middle of that storm and, and waiting on God. Okay, God, here's an opportunity. Here's an opportunity for me to show them that you're powerful. Here's an opportunity for me to be able to face this storm and the world to see it didn't knock me down. That's what patience is. Patience is being able to stand in the middle of that roaring sea. Just like those, just like Peter, when, when Peter said, Lord, can I step out of the boat? And, and the Lord said, Come. And he stepped out on the boat and he walked on. It was that storm was an opportunity for Peter to show his faith. It was an opportunity. Oh, yeah, we know he sank, but he did something nobody else has ever done. He walked on water for a while. And you know what? If he had never taken his eyes off of Jesus, he could have walked all the way across the Atlantic Ocean. It was an opportunity to show the power of God. That's all. That's all James is saying. The storm you're facing, the testing, the trying, the temptation, all it is is an opportunity to prove the power of God. In verse 4, he says, but let patience have her perfect work. What is perfect work? That means that you have grown from being a baby in Christ to being a mature Christian. The word perfect means mature. In other words, the trial is simply take you from being an immature Christian. What is an immature Christian? It's that one that faces the storm and caves in. That, 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 that just doesn't have the faith in God. Runs off crying and moaning. Oh, I can't take another day of this. And we've got to, we've got to learn that what he's saying is that, that, that by standing with God through the storm, the longer we stand there, bigger the patience. The longer we stand there, the more that we can stand, the more that we can take another step on the wall. Peter can take another step on the wall. He can take, you know what every one of those steps did? It made him, it made him a stronger Christian because he, he was doing something that nobody had ever done before. And, and if we can take another step, then we feel built more patience. And another step, and we've built more patience. If we don't take a step, then we don't mature. We don't ever walk in the world. He's trying to get us to see that we, we can grow and mature and have so much faith 
have so much faith we can step out of the boat. So much faith that we know when the storm hits, it's okay. Yeah, it's going to be hard. Yeah, I'm not going to like one moment of it. But I've got a God that can help me through it. That's what faith is. That's what James is trying to get these Jews to see. These Jews were going through hard times. And James is saying, face the trials. Face the trials and look at the opportunity to teach those Romans that your God is bigger than their God. That's what the faith is. So we need to understand that that we can find happiness in our trials. In our trials. Now, it's not fun. <laughs> but the happiness comes from the fact that we know that this is an opportunity for me to show them that I can. So let's just Let's just praise him for all that he's